continuing a reading of Major Robert Crisp's Brazen Chariots, a Ballantine paperback, page 14 at the bottom. It was the first practical and beneficial effect of Anglo-American cooperation on land in that theater of the war, and although the Americans jibbed a bit at the 14 modifications that our tank experts thought necessary to introduce, it set the atmosphere for the many subsequent occasions when American technicians had to instruct British tank crews in new types of American tanks. At the end of August, three RTR moved from Heliopolis to Beni Yusuf, some 20 miles the other side of Cairo, where we joined up with the other two armored units of the 4th Armored Brigade, the 8th Hussars and 5 RTR. It was a bleak, hot and dusty place of long tin huts and tents, where we sweltered and swore our way through training and re-equipping, our grunts and groans swelling the raucous chorus from the adjacent camel patrol of the Egyptian army. My only light relief was provided by my Batman's letters to his wife, which I had to censor. He was a holder-upper in civilian life and wielded his pen like a riveting hammer with about three words to the page, most of which were abusive references to the old wife. This was a female I could not identify until a visiting officer of the Scots Guard told me it was a mother-in-law. After one spell of about three weeks without a letter home, I mentioned to my Batman during the course of general conversation that he did not seem to be corresponding with his wife, and I hoped nothing had gone wrong. That afternoon, he produced a letter which began, Dear wife, I am sorry you have not had my last three letters which were sunk by enemy action. Tell the old bitch... Unquote. Benny Yusuf was a little too remote from the center of Cairo to get the full flavor of impending events. We heard of Wavell's dismissal, of course, and were astonished by it, and his replacement by Oshenlek, but we sensed only dimly the new urgency that was creeping into everything. The nearest we got to it, except on our occasional visits to Gezaira, was the oft-repeated remark of A, Squadron's Major, who had been a pre-war subaltern in India under Oshenlek. Bloody good chap, the Auk. On the whole, we all regarded our removal to Beni Yosef as a piece of typical staff bloody-mindedness. By the end of September, we were a fully equipped battalion again, with men and machines up to strength, Reorganization under a new commanding officer, Bunny Ewens, had confirmed me as a captain, second in command of C Squadron, which meant I kept my troop of honeys. This suited me fine. I had no ambitions as far as promotion was concerned. I wanted to be left alone to run my troop the way I wanted to run it. The extra money was the only significant feature. I had always found it difficult to reconcile a lieutenant's pay with a major's tastes. At this time, a steady flow of top-ranking brass, including General Cunningham, fresh from his triumphs in East Africa, and, for some curious reason, the Maharaja of Kashmir, began visiting our camp. It all added up to something, and soon we learned that a great new organization had been formed with Cunningham in command. They called it the Eighth Army. It will help in an understanding of subsequent events if I give a brief description of the setup of 4th Armored Brigade. It was a comprehensive operational unit composed of the three tank regiments I have referred to, each of which had attached to it a troop of 25-pounder guns of the Royal Horse Artillery, a detachment of the Scots Guards, and anti-tank and anti-aircraft units. The whole was commanded by Brigadier Alec Gatehouse, DSOMC, who could be described as a tank officer as distinct from a cavalry officer, and who was probably the best handler of armor in the desert at the time. It was the first fully self-contained combat team on such a large scale in the British Army, and I mention it in some detail because it was destined to play such a decisive part in a campaign in which control often evaporated and units disintegrated. Within this entity, we were to move and fight, eat and sleep a little, die and nearly die every day and night for the next five weeks. According to Gatehouse's records, the brigade was in action continuously for the first 14 days of this period without rest or maintenance and with an average of two battles a day. 
The brigade center line covered 1,700 miles, and many unit tanks traveled over 3,000. 172 honeys were knocked out by the enemy in five weeks. The total strength was 163, and I myself had six tanks knocked out. The average sleep for commanders during the 14 days was one and a half hours in 24. At the end of the campaign, the 400 tanks under Rommel's command had been reduced to 58. Fortunately for our peace of mind, these were events which lay well concealed and certainly unimagined in the dust and smoke of the future. The first week in October saw us encamped on the barren spaces west of the Cairo Fayoum Road for our battle practice with live ammunition. An inter-troop and inter-squadron competition was arranged to add a little stimulus to the exercise. Troop by troop, we went off to the firing area on the wide open spaces west of the Fayoum Road. I had an idea which I wanted to try out. It was inspired by the fact that enemy anti-tank weapons, especially the newly introduced 88mm gun that had played havoc with our tanks in the ill-fated battle axe show, could knock us out at 3,000 yards whereas the maximum effective range of our 37mm and 2-pounder guns was reckoned to be about 1,200. This turned out to be wildly optimistic. The result in simple arithmetic was that we would have to be within range of their tanks and guns for 1,800 yards before we could hope to get close enough to do any damage. 1,800 yards in those circumstances is a long way. It's 64,800 inches.